Lads, I have been following, so I've not been in touch. My head's on fire doing admin as I'm gash at it, but uh, keep going. I know it's a slog, it hurts, but it will be worth it in the end. Obviously, I'm getting DM'd to fuck by your social manager. But um, is is a message basically of me saying keep digging in. You know it'll be worth it in the end. Good effort, man. Give it some, then. You got no fans? Well, we got the sex. Carla, we got the sex before, so come on. Gentlemen, can I start by saying what an absolute honour it is to have four of my brothers on my show, all of whom have achieved something which is not just absolutely fantastic, incredible, bordering, I'm sure, to most people on superhuman, but it's also something, as Brucey will will tell you, we chatted about in the pub the other night for about three hours because I'd really love to do it, so... This makes it a, a, an extra special podcast for me. Um, I just want to say it's, I don't know how we're going to do it with four people. Uh, maybe I I just pick somebody so we're not all talking over each other. Um, so Oscar, how did this, how did this, well, What's your service history or a bit about yourself? Uh, so, so I joined I joined the Corps in uh, the beginning of 2014 um, and, and had a great career, really enjoyed it. Uh, but I'm from New Zealand originally, uh, grew up there and I want to move back. So I, I was intending to leave uh, the Marines, well, I left the Marines in, in July last year. Uh, but I'm also good friends with Brucey and Nutty, who, who you mentioned earlier. Uh, who, who rode last year and they when I, as I was leaving they said oh we're putting together another team for the Atlantic this year do you want to jump on and I had no reason not to really so that's kind of what led me on to on to do the Atlantic Wow which part of New Zealand are you from mate? Uh, the top of the South Island near Nelson Okay is, is that near Raglan? Uh, I'm not sure I don't think so no Yeah they got new is in New Plymouth that way? Uh, new, yeah, New Plymouth in the in the North Island on the on the on the west coast of the North Island. Yeah, I've spent some time around the, um, those places. It's an absolutely incredible, incredible uh, country, New Zealand. Is that is that a big thing then coming over yeah, here? Yeah, to really join, beautiful. Is it a big thing to come over and join the Marines? Is that an easy, an easy move? Uh, it, it's. It's possible to do, yeah. People from the, um, from the Commonwealth are allowed to join. There's lots of South Africans. Uh, I've only met a couple of other Kiwis that have done it, uh, but I've got a dual passport, so I was looking at joining the military over there and was sort of looking at the options available to me and, and, and realised I, I, you know, I could come out and join the, join the Marines, so I thought I'd give it a go. Mm. And one thing led to another. And what, um, what unit have you served in? Uh, so I did a couple of years uh, as a sprog up at 4-3, and then I was down in, uh, at 40 Commando in Taunton for about two and a half years, and then spent the rest of my career at 4-2. Brilliant. Yeah, 4-2, that was my unit. Um, do you want to introduce the other guys? Just yeah. Is that going to save us a bit of time? And your your video, by the way, is... Yeah, can do, yeah. It, your video is frozen. I'm not sure. That's probably a... Wi-Fi signal issue, but don't... Oh, mine is. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. Okay. It's probably the uh, further yeah, so, you go... So, the, the further you go from the Wi-Fi, the more... <laughs> the weaker the signal gets, I guess. Yeah. But but go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Oscar Stone. Uh, and then we've got um, Connor Patterson, uh, who's... I don't know what order the, the screens are on your screen but connor's the next one down for me uh and then mitch is uh the other lamp of the dark beard and then 
Jason Jason Gardner is in uh, is in his car there. Yes, got it. And um, did you all serve in the same unit together, or are you all from across different places in the corps? Uh, so we we actually only met through the, through through this rowing team. Uh, Jason, Jason and I were were part of uh, the original Atlantic Dagger team that we put together uh, since sort of July last year. Um, but we had dramas with the other two lads in our team who were who were both serving, uh, and they couldn't get the time off from the Marines, uh, and so they had to drop out. And Connor and Mitch were part of a team called Atlantic Warrior, who had similar dra- similar team dramas where they lost two of their team members. So we we amalgamated the two teams. Literally at the last minute, the first time Jason and I met Connor and Mitch was in Gran Canaria a week a week before we rode. Um, so none of us and Jason and I haven't served together, so none of us really knew each other before this. Sorry, my phone's falling over. Yeah, none, none of none of us really knew each other before we before we came on the road. Have you guys? Have you been in the Middle East? I, I, I can't. I'm not. I can't keep up with the age range and the 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 time range no so I I, 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 I missed out on Afghanistan uh, I joined too late and um, but but Chase was in um, a bit before us so he, he's he served in Afghanistan uh, but Mitch and I Mitch and I missed out on that what was that like Jace you'll have to you'll have to take yourself off mute mate yeah, I, I done. Um, uh, I took part in uh, Herrick Nine with uh, Four Two Commando K Company. Um, it was a yeah, it was a good, it was a good experience. You know, done a, a wide wide variety of soldiering. Obviously, we we were doing strike ops at the time, so it wasn't you know, it it was very. It wasn't like we were in a fob scrapping every day. We were doing you know anything from intel gathering to you know sort of f- finding EOD um, IED factories. To obviously, you know, battling with the insurgents as well. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a valuable experience. You know, one of my highlights, of my core, uh, my, my core history. You know. Yeah, you sound like you're in the West Country, or you're from the West Country. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I can't shake that. <laughs> Is that Somerset or Devon? Uh, Bristol. 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 Okay. <laughs> yes, and so. Yeah, you, if you came from two different boats am, amalgamated, then how does how does like this idea come up? Is this something that comes up over a couple of beers? I don't know. Shall we go to Connor? Do you want to ask answer that one? Yeah, sure. So um, it was actually um, Harry who um, came up with the idea of combining the two teams. Um, due to you know what Oscar said about his uh, unfortunate circumstances, he came up with the idea of um, of combining the two teams because Mitch and I had a bit of experience on the boats and uh, we already had our team put together. Um, so we were lucky enough to be given the opportunity to join Oscar and uh, Jason in the Team Atlantic Dagger. Mm. Are you all there. are you all serving or any of you veterans? So. Um, I am actually uh, I'm actually in the Merchant Navy. It's been kind of swept away that I'm also a, a, a Marine or ex-Marine, um, but uh, I'm unfortunate enough to join the teams. Uh, but I'm actually a serving um, navigation officer in the Merchant Navy. I've been swept up with the guys. Um, so it's been a fantastic opportunity to um, due, due to having um, a lot of connections in the Corps uh, and the ship I work on, working close with the Corps. Um, I had a fantastic opportunity to um, see a lot of the world with those guys. So... Um, but um, yeah, the guys are all um, all veterans now. So, mm. hey, Merchant Navy, I was on Invincible for um, a year, and I love my time at sea. I was always thinking about what it must be like to be in a Merchant Navy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, have you been on many many ships? No, so um, I've just been uh, on the one ship throughout my career. Um, but you know, we've been as far as. Um, Colombia and as far as the Mediterranean and Norway and Bermuda and a fantastic way to uh, see the world. And um, what what kind of ship was that? So it's a worldwide support vessel, but I've uh, been fortunate enough to be contracted to the MOD. So wherever the guys do their training, we uh, get a chance to take their kit over and um, facilitate their training. Yeah, got you, got you. And um, 
do the merchant navy is it do they just supply the navy or is there other roles that we we don't think of so the merchant navy is uh, is, a, is a kind of collective term an umbrella term for all commercial shipping uh, you might be thinking of the royal fleet auxiliary ah uh, yeah okay that's that's um what's in my head yeah got you yeah sorry no so the rfa is you know, predominantly you know they they support the navy and they float around and you know um give them all the supplies they need but the um yeah sorry the merch navy is the collective term for commercial shipping mm. um but fortunately like i said um my company is contracts to the mod so we get to uh, see a bit more of the world got you did these guys give you a lot of shit then for being uh not particularly actually um yeah the guys are very kind and um they welcomed me kindly you've got to say <laughs> that <laughs> yeah exactly brilliant and um yes yeah, so sorry i can't remember if we answered the question was it well, where does an idea like this you know first come from so you've obviously got a nautical background connor um so was that something i mean do you like reading books and stuff on the on the on the open ocean um, yeah, of course. Just just living it for the past eight years, um, you know, sailed across a few oceans, and just basically living in, growing up in the southwest, um, growing up on the water, just have a huge passion for, for everything water based. So you know, ocean rowing was just the next thing to do. You know, so, um, but through my connections, through having lots of friends in the core, um, I was really lucky to be given an opportunity to join the um, the two rowing teams, and um, here we are. Yes, brilliant, brilliant. And um, Mitch, how are you doing, mate? Hi, Chris. Yeah, yeah, I'm grand, mate. Just happy to be on dry land. Yes, I saw your little video as you came into, was it Barbados, wasn't it? Yeah, Port of St. Charles and Barbados. It wasn't quite as, as, as smooth a video as we'd hoped. We were hoping for flares and, and dramatics, but um, it, it, it didn't take away from the moment. It was still one of the best moments of all of our lives. I think everyone would. Yeah, these things never really go to plan, do they? No, but yeah, nothing survives first contact, but it's still it's worth every moment, definitely. Yeah, and how did you come up with the idea to do this? Uh, well, it's, it's similar. I only left the Corps in, um, in end of March last year, and I'd just been working um, private security for a couple of weeks, and uh, another veteran friend of mine um, that I was working with, just he just turned around to me and said, uh, would you, how would you feel about rowing, rowing an ocean, rowing the Atlantic? And I just went, hell yeah, why not? Um, so I'd, I'd never... Uh, the ocean i love the ocean but i've never really been done much on it so it was the concept of rowing across an ocean having never been on touched a rowing boat in my life was quite a good challenge and it's just kind of encapsulated everything that appeals to me about adventure and that kind of thing so um yeah he, i said yeah why not he added me to a whatsapp group which um the lads from last year brucey nutty uh chris martin who organized everything mission atlantic you know he's um the, the big boss uh they're all part of that team um so i joined that just randomly joined the whatsapp group in um in, eight, in eight may and um and yeah a few months a couple of months later i got added to Added to a random group with the guys, me, the uh, Connor, and another two guys, and then obviously, as I say, after several months of of short notice but hard graft, it kind of um, wasn't looking promising. But then we very, really, really fortunately got the opportunity last minute to um, to, ju- to jump on with this. So luckily, managed to realise the dream in the end. Mm. Was so? Did you guys go with Mission Atlantic? Yeah, so the Abyss Atlantic is the company owned by Chris Martin, who just facilitates and um, owns the boat, basically. So we were really lucky, really, really lucky, because he's such a such a nice person, and um, he knows what has all the expertise, and um, he's a lot of people work for him. Um, like the person we're here with now, um, called Nick, who's um, a great person, and they just know everything about the boats, what to do, um, everything. So the support was was just brilliant. But uh, Mission Atlantic was the company, yeah, basically overseeing everything. Yeah, Brucey was telling me about it. Sounds um almost like a sort of cut price package to get across the Atlantic compared to some some Yeah. It's brilliant. It's that yeah, it's a great concept. They're trying to build it over the next couple of years to um, offer it to ex servicemen. Uh, it's given the opportunity to obviously do like one of the biggest kind of challenges in the world, um, to open it up to everyone really, because it's really, you know, it's quite expensive and it's it's normally kind of reserved for 
more the kind of wealthier you know if you have a lot of money in this this, this gives this gives lad this gives lads the opportunity who wouldn't have had it otherwise to um to do it like ourselves really um yeah it just gives us the opportunity for hard graft and to uh to realize their dreams really yes and it gives me the opportunity that's what i'm excited about yeah you're going to be we'll, we'll, we'll coach you through it now yeah well i want to i definitely want to row across the atlantic um and I shouldn't, I suppose we shouldn't minimize the danger because obviously there's all sorts of stuff, isn't there? You could hit a container, you could be mown down by a ship, you could get separated from the boat, you could just have an accident on board that could turn things really nasty. But generally speaking, it's, or should I say statistically, it's fairly safe. Am I, am I right in thinking that? Yeah. yeah, that's correct. Statistically, because because um, the you know you, everyone undergoes some training beforehand. You're familiarised with the boat. You're always you're always clipped onto the boat um, with a harness and a and a, and a, um, and a line. So even if you were thrown off the boat in a storm, you'd still be attached. So as long as you're diligent, as long as you're doing all the correct drills, so as long as you're att attached onto the boat, as long as you're always keeping the hatches closed. So when there's a massive wave, it doesn't fill up the boat and then that means if it's filled up with water it means you can't it can't turn over if you're capsized and stuff like that so it's yeah it's, it's kind of safe yeah statistically it's safe but like you say there's still there's still all them issues because when you're a thousand miles from land if there's one kind of accident or say like a bleed or anything like that um, it is scary to think yeah by the time anyone gets to you you'll, you'll be dead so it's it's a it's safe but it's at the same time you you always kind of got that in the back of your mind of you know, you've got to be switched on. You've got to be switched on the whole time. Yeah, I mean, it might be something silly, like you could, you know, burn yourself cooking or something, couldn't you? That's it. And then, and then there you are. That that gets infected. And all, you, you, all you've got is some a, a few, like, you know, dressings and antibiotics and that on board. And essentially, you've just got to be, you've got to be between you. You've got to be the team medic, basically, and to just help each other out. And, um, yeah, all sorts of crazy stuff. Obviously, the weather's the worst thing with the storms and that. And it's the scariest one. Um, but the boats are designed. They're designed to, to to be completely capsized multiple times and be absolutely fine. So we're all a bit, a little bit worried. But um, it's all about having confidence in your boat. You know, personally, after about a week or after a few days, actually, just kind of realised, right, okay, you know, this this is she's this boat. She's going to look after us. And you, yeah, as long as you have confidence, you, you you you'll be fine. You'll ride it through. Yes. Well, the wonderful Mick Dawson is proof of that, isn't he? Because he's he's had a few dunkings. Hello, hello, Mick, if you're watching. Um, is it is it? Um, do you think I'm going to say marine? I was going to say service personnel, but there's some pretty rubbish service personnel in the world. It, 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 do you think being from an elite unit that means? doing the stuff, the little things like closing the hatches, making sure everyone's got their safety line on, sticking to the routine. Do you think that comes e easier or more naturally? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say like people like Connor at a disadvantage because Connor's he was amazing and he was switched on and he was basically, you would have thought he was one of the Marines to be honest. But yeah, that kind of small, the little body body system, you know, just little things like just every single 10 minutes making sure everyone's okay and he, and it's more the openness as well you know because you're because they're so used to basically being completely up front with the guys like you know within the first day we were completely naked with in each other's faces like you know we're showing the whole world everything so the fact that if there's any little niggles you can instantly say can you have a look at my bum or, you know or if there's anything like that any little issue being um being like that being ex ex service we can you know, you just kind of you're used to just looking out for each other in that way and just making sure the attention to detail, making sure the little things, like you say, um, if someone's forgot to to latch on, just say, you know, latch on or little things like that. Yeah, I think it makes it. Yeah. So it probably it's an advantage. I wouldn't say it's obviously a necessity, but it's main. The main advantage is just being used to kind of being uncomfortable, you know, and being um, being used to being in confined spaces with with the lads basically and just being able to just mentally push through it and just um whilst keeping a clear head really was there anyone saying can you look at my bum when, when there's actually nothing nothing wrong with them oh several times yeah oscar was uh yeah he, he, he loved that he, he was a top man for that although he did genuinely probably have 
the worst fun. So um, yeah, every single morning, every single time the hatch opened, um, whilst having dinner, I was always uh, I was always um, privileged with the uh, the lovely yeah. sight, which I will leave to your own. Is a uh, mm, shame we're on YouTube. Sh- YouTube won't allow any of that stuff. But there you go, Oscar. You could have could have mooned the world. Um, so. Oscar, tell us, obviously, one of the most important things is who, who were you raising money for? Uh, so we, we were raising money for the Royal Marines charity uh, exclusively. So some, some teams sort of split, split that, but, you know, a couple of teams I've, I've seen have, have raised money for, you know, one or two charities. But we thought um, it, w- it would just be better to pull all that money into one place. Um, and, and the Royal Marines, is, Royal Marines charity is something very close to all of our hearts. And, and you know, all of us that served in the Marines know of people who benefited from it you know in a small way or a major way uh, and they do a lot for for our community uh of, of serving and former marines and keeping everyone together so so it was it was something close to all our hearts that we thought would be uh, an important thing to raise money for yeah and we should remember that because everyone's been locked down for two years that they've suffered yeah. all these charities have suffered greatly haven't they because people Absolutely. haven't been yeah. haven't been out and about and there's probably more demand for their services as well with people suffering from mental health due to, due to the lockdowns and everything as well. So, Yes. And uh, well, yeah, of course. Yes. That's a, 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 another whole, whole thing again, isn't it? The mental health and, and lots of it, domestic violence and addiction yeah. and all goes Absolutely. on. Um, and I'm looking at your fundraiser now doing really well up to 24,000. Yeah, yeah. So, so we we Jack, Jack, our social media guy, who's been back here. He's uh he's he's been fantastic. He was he was sort of the the key keystone of the whole operation. Really, he was he was he was keeping us informed on on you know, passing messages through through you know up to us and 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 back down and and checking in with us daily, if if not more than that. You know, he was sending messages all the time to us and and uh, and and I've heard from loads of people. That I've spoken to since we've been back, that, that he was, you know, all over the social media. So he he was, he's really been key in helping helping drive that fundraiser whilst we've been away. Oscar, who was that? Sorry, it's been, a, been a real lifesaver for us actually. Who who was it? Sorry, so, uh, Jack Broughton. He he was our social media guy. Uh, a lad called Jack Jack Broughton. Yeah. He's our, he was our social media guy. He's a he's a former former army army guy who was injured. Um, and uh, um, and he, he's someone that I met through through Brucey and Nutty, and, and they got on really well with him. And he's keen to row the Atlantic at some point once once he's in a once he's in a fit state for it. And uh, and so I thought we you know we get him on our team as our social media guy, so sort of land representative land land representative. And uh, and he's he's been one of the one of the key members of the team. Um, you know since we've been away, he's been a driving force behind you know the fundraising and and the social media and everything. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet the guys are godsend because when you're doing something yeah. like that, you you need a safe pair of hands in charge of your media, and 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 um, absolutely, a lot of people will fake show feign interest, and after a week they lose, you know. So it sounds like you you well done, Jack, is what we're trying to say. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Yeah, thank you. So, how do you how do you get the equipment together? Or I'm guessing with Mission Atlantic all the boats come with everything they need. Um, how, how does that work then? Yeah, Obviously, so, so Chris, so Chris Martin, he, he, he's sort of sets up this package for us, if you like, but um, the way, the, the way it costs less than, than the Talisca whiskey, for example, is that uh, we're doing it completely unsupported. So there's no support vessels. Um, the only support we get from him once we're on the water is, is weather updates and any medical um, advice that we need, really. Um, so we're on our own, uh, and that's that's how the price is, is significantly less. So we're we're buying the boat off him with all the equipment, the desalination pump, you know, all the all the running kit basically, uh, and it's up to us to source food separately uh, and any other, you know, all the uh, the sort of consumables essentially. Um, uh, so so we we. Chris will help. Chris helps us with the shipping out to to Gran Canaria, the shipping back from Barbados, getting the boat to the start line in a good good state, and then once we set off, it's that's on us until we get to Barbados, and then he'll help ship it back. Mm. So, uh, what um, when I asked Brucey's team this question, 
they all started laughing. Um, and I'll explain why. But what 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 did you eat? Uh, so we we were on um, uh, military Arctic rations, so dehydrated uh, dehydrated um, rations. So quite nutritious, but very boring after a while. You know, if we were having a couple of meals a day, dehydrated meals, we just pour boiling water in and a load of snacks, the old biscuit browns, all quite dry food, but nutritious, calorific, but a bit boring after a while. Yeah, yeah I bet you want to supplement that with a few tins of, I don't know, I was going to say fish, but I suppose there's fish coming in the boat all the time, uh, uh, from what I've heard. Yeah, towards the end, anyway, we had we had we were having you know tens of, tens of fish jumping on the boat a day. And the last week or so, we were getting flying fish all over. A couple of us caught flying fish in the face and all of that stuff. It's a delicacy in Barbados, is certainly. A, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, in terms of supplementing the rations, we we didn't supplement it much, but you know, I would I would say if there's space on the boat, throw in some tins of tins of fruit because we had one of them for halfway mark, and it was it was. It was heaven, really, heaven, really good on the halfway mark, cracking a tin of pineapple. And some salami from what I've been reading. Yeah, yeah, we also had some salami. It, it, it does get a little bit mouldy, but you just cut the mouldy bits off and it, it's dry meat. It was good to go. None of us had any issues with it. So. Yes, it's probably better than what they had 400 years ago at sea. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So... um. Let's come back to, to, to Connor. Did, did you have to teach all the guys how to navigate or did you take all that responsibility? Sorry, sorry. Um, so we, we tried to um, every maybe seven days um, rotate the cabin. So all of the navigation equipment is in the back of the, of the boat. Um, so everyone got a chance to have a go at the nav. Um, so the person in the bow seat was the sort of effectively the navigator because he had his foot on the pedal. So he's looking at the compass um, throughout the duration. Um, we had a little um, clip of repeater, which was going to give us our sort of track and bearing. But unfortunately, that broke a few hours before we set off. Um, and we weren't able to replace it. So um, the guys diligently um, kept us on the bearing. That's why it might have looked a bit squiggly as we were coming down. Um, but it was, it was relatively straightforward. We were given charts, um, but it was just going between the waypoints and just trying to follow the bearings and keeping on track as much as we could. Mm. And I'm guessing, what do they say, the trade winds are in your fa favour? Exactly, yeah. We were um, incredibly fortunate um, throughout our row. You know, the, the trade winds um, were fairly consistent. We had um, really fantastic weather. Um, we, we did come against some... Um, come up against some currents which are very frustrating there's nothing much we can do about that um which kind of knocked off a couple of knots of our speed but um yeah we we're incredibly fortunate um the weather was behind us we i think it was week going into week two or three um we had some pretty hairy weather um i think the guys we could all agree it was maybe three to four meter swells um got pretty hairy um but luckily it was all behind us so we were just surfing uh, most of the time which was really quite fun how frightening is it when the waves are, are, are building? Um, I think we, we all spoke about that the other night, actually. Um, it wasn't, it, there were times it was quite frightening, you know, but when, when it's behind you, it's actually quite fun because um, if, if you can just get a bit of a grip of the situation, um, it's, it doesn't, it's not actually that scary. Um, it can be actually quite fun. Um, Oscar was telling me one of his highlights was... Um, when he was rowing with Jay, they got really locked in and they were really um, surfing and keeping it on course. Um, I remember laughing because I was in the in the bow seat um, navigating, and Mitch was in the in the stern seat. And um, unfortunately, because of the way the boat was trimmed at the time, we were quite stern heavy. Um, so when we were surfing, the waves were basically just crashing into the boat, and Mitch was getting soaked. Um, I remember just laughing my head off because he just seemed to be getting wet constantly. Um, so it was never I would say it was never that scary um, at night it was probably quite scary because you couldn't really see the waves coming um, but it was, I think it was more fun than, than scary because we were fortunate it was a bubble behind us Did you have to put a, a drogue anchor in at all? 
so there was a time where it was getting quite windy and I thought it might be a good idea to, to put our drogue out. But um, the wind wasn't as, you know, you need um, 30 to 40 knots to really get the benefits of the drogue. Uh, so when we put it out, it didn't really work. But it was a good little test to see uh, what it was like. Mm. And um, was anyone seasick? No, actually, we're all, um, I was, I get, I'm, you know, I'm in the most but I get seasick. Um, I think we're all expecting to get seasick because um, the boat is so low to the water. There's not so much of a pivot point. So, you know, you're, you're as low as you can get. So um, fortunately, no, I think we all got away with it, really. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Mitch, what, what was I going to ask you? Um, yeah, can you tell us what's, I don't, I was going to say, I got the feeling if you were to have done this trip, say, 50 years ago, you'd have seen an abundance of ocean life. Um, I get the feeling it's all kind of been eaten now because of the big industrial fishing ships that take up all the krill and the bigger fish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that you don't see so much going across as you might might have done. But can you tell us, is that, is that the case? And, and did you see a lot of wildlife? Oh, nice, no, Chris. We were very fortunate, uh, I think, really. Um, probably, yeah, if you go back 50 years, it probably would have been, you know, every multiple times a day you saw things. But we were, yeah, we were very lucky. We seemed to be attracted to wildlife. So by day two, we, um, we had a whole pod of dolphins alongside us, um, following us. And um, probably that mean kind of, uh, well, most of the lads, one of our highlights was like after a few days um, was when it was completely flat as, as a pancake and um, pitch black. And all you could see was like bolts of lightning under the water and dolphins swimming through, swimming through the glowing bioluminescence. Mm -hmm. So you had like, you had like four dolphins around, the, five dolphins around us the whole time for about an hour, um, swimming in like pairs or in freeze under the boat in just a stream of glowing green um, algae basically following them and it was just like magical it was just something out of a dream and yeah pe periodically we had several um, like dorados and jumping you know five ten feet out in the air we had um, fish big big fish swim swimming alongside us every other day um, about four or five times we had big um, fairly large whales just just surface very close to us about halfway through you know, one of the only times that we cleared the boat um, Connor was scrapping along the um scraping along the uh, the side of the boat and I thought I heard his snorkel and I looked to my right and 20 yards to our right Connor was on the left when I was on the right so there was a big whale just breaching just coming out of the water there um, and then probably one of the craziest days we had was we getting smashed in the face by the flying fish and then me and Connor had a, a small tuna just leap out of the water and it Connor absolutely cracked his pants and if we caught a small tuna jump out of the water and we were like what the hell it, it slid along the boat and then slid back into the water and then he got up and then, and then proceeded to fall over on top of me um, in shock and he said shark shark and um it's one of the best moments we stood up and what we thought was a shark it must have been at least an eight nine ten foot shadow at the back of the boat and it was actually a, a giant six seven hundred pound blue marlin um that was that was literally five yards from our, from the back of our boat and it followed us for half an hour and um you'll see if you keep an eye on the um I'm actually got the video. I've got all the videos of the wildlife. I've got um, pods of dolphins. I've got a video of that blue marlin. So if you keep an eye on it, all the um, all the footage of the wildlife will come. Yes, yeah, so we were very fortunate. And then about a week before, but in the middle of the day, we had a pod of about 40, 50 pilot whales for about an hour and a half that followed us the whole way. Um, literally, like we had like seven at a time within uh, within oars reach. They were you know nearly touching the oars with us the entire way. So yeah, I mean, probably it would have been crazy 50 years ago, but I think we were, we can all agree we were mega, mega fortunate. And um, yeah, it wasn't too fun with the flying fish getting smacked in the face. Yeah, uh, but that was all part of the parcel, really. I had a, um, I had a flying flesh, fish fly through the three inch gap of the hatch whilst I was sleeping, landed on my belly and, and bits, and I shot up scared as hell with a fish on me um so we had yeah we had some good encounters i think overall we had some great encounters with um with the wildlife and the birds as well lots of quite a lot of birds you'd be surprised even to be in a thousand miles out to sea um sea sea starlings and stuff um birds pretty much every single day at least every single day at least one point you saw a bird which was pretty incredible um thinking how far out they were so um Mate, they probably yeah. would probably followed you from union street yeah 100 percent. that was it Definitely. 
yeah, I didn't see any pigeons. They weren't they weren't too lost. But um, it was we were all very privileged. We were all very humble to um, to get that opportunity. Really, uh, yeah, no sharks unfortunately, but um, probably a good thing. Uh, but yeah, overall, overall, it was um, yeah, very good. Did you have to get under the boat and clean the the algae and the barnacles off? We had to do it quite a lot, but we like, we only had done it once. Kind of done it, kind of done it just the one time after after that period of bad weather we were talking about. After about three weeks, um, we finally calmed down. He, he we got we got in basically. I kind of got in, sorry, and um, yeah, just just didn't take long. We had to clean it off because if you keep it on there, it builds up and it causes a little bit of drag and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, miraculously, um, it didn't build up too much. A lot of people do it weekly, but we done it once. So um, mm. yeah, it was quite, it's not a hard job, but it was, yeah, you'd be doing it once. Yeah, got you. Uh, Oscar, can you tell us what, what was your routine like and what's it like sticking to a, to a routine? Oh, Oscar, don't know if oh, you can sorry, hear me. Yeah. I can hear you again now. Uh, I lost. I lost you. I missed that question. Do you mind repeating that? Yeah, I was going to say what 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 was your routines, and and how was it sticking to them? Like you know, getting out of your sleeping bag to have to go and row again. Yeah. So our routine, um, we'd heard from other teams, particularly Brucey and Nutty, that uh, that it gets extremely hot during the day in the cabins. Uh, so we we were planning on a three hour on three hour off routine, um, but just before we left, we decided that between nine a.m. in the morning and and three o'clock in the afternoon during that six hour hot window, we'd change it to one and a half hours, so there's less time in the heat of the cabins, uh, and that worked extremely well for us. So we had shorter shorter sessions during the day, and then during the cooler hours, it was really warm. Uh, and and that that worked. That was a, a a really. We were all pretty chuffed that, that we kept to that because that, that worked really well. In terms of getting up for the shift, it's like getting up for century. You know, it's never particularly nice. But once you're out and you're on the on the oars, you, you sort of wake up. You get back used to it again. But, but the actual waking up is always pretty grim. I think. Do you get like your favourite person that you want to row with? Am I going to cause trouble now? <laughs> no, we, we, we rode in pairs. We stick, stuck to those pairs. Me and Jace were rowing together and Connor and Mitch were rowing as a pair. So it didn't, we didn't really, we didn't change her out. So no, uh, no divorces then? No, no, no divorce, thankfully. Yeah. Um, see, one thing that puts me off going in a team is I, I would be like the best rower. I'd, I'd I'd be just like the strongest guy on the boat and that might put the other lads or ladies noses out of joint. But um was there anyone that was particularly oh, sorry, like my internet's playing up again? Uh it's probably just as good because it's just talking a load of nonsense, but <laughs> um, is it is was there anybody that was like a super rower or really loved it or or said, look, I'll do your shift for you or this kind of stuff? Uh, I don't think anyone was noticeably stronger than anyone else, to be honest. We were all pretty, pretty equal. Um, if, if any of us had had dramas, I've got no doubt that any of us would have jumped in on a shift for another of them. Uh, we, we were all pretty, pretty open for that, but we were quite lucky in that no one had any injuries or, or niggles or anything like that. So there was a requirement to, to jump on for each other, but I'm, I'm pretty confident we, you know, I would, we would have all jumped on for each other if, if that was the case, we shared the load. Um, yeah, good job. But, but and there was, thankfully, there wasn't requirement for it. Were you worried about shipping? Uh, apparently, you've got an alarm of you or some sort of alert device. Yeah, so part of the GPS suite on there is, is a, um, a unit called the AIS automatic alert system, uh, and that basically broadcasts your position on the GPS to other vessels. Uh, and, and part of that is it will it will predict, um, you know, with the course that you're on and the course another ship's on, whether or not you're likely to collide or, or get dangerously close. Uh, and, and you can set the parameters for that and it will set off an alarm within the cabin. Um, so, so we did have that go off a couple of times, uh, but it was as simple as just radioing the vessel and saying, look, you know, what your attentions, we're quite we're quite unmaneuverable. Do you want us to go firm and let you go past or, or are you happy to change course and stay a mile away from us sort of thing? And, 
and we, we didn't really have any dramas with that thankfully we were quite vigilant and looking out for vessels that were close we did you really speak, have any close calls thankfully did you speak to a lot of other vessels or skippers yeah so if, if, whenever there was a boat that was sort of within a mile or two of us we had that a couple of times particularly towards the end there were some sailing yachts that were crossing the Atlantic and sort of sailed within a mile or two of us we'd hail them on the radio and say hi and you know, try and just hear someone else's voice really and and, uh, and they were they were always quite interested in what we were doing uh, we just have a bit of a gang gang and then and then they'd go on their way it was, it was a bit of morale for us as well they didn't come over and give you a, a bottle of champagne and a, a roast meal or anything then no we were ho- i was hoping they would personally but but we, they never got around to it mm. <laughs> we didn't we didn't manage to persuade them and connor what what did you listen to music as you went across? Yeah, so um, we all had our own different music um, playlists. We get to know a bit more about each other, what sort of music we're into. Um, and then unfortunately, after 30 days, um, all of our Spotify accounts crashed. Um, and that was when we turned to the audiobooks. Um, and actually really worked in our favour. That. That's what Brucey said. He said that when you got offshores, they found out that Spotify doesn't doesn't work. I would have thought um, he'd have passed that tip on to you. Oh yeah, we, we did we did expect that. We were able to put there's a little you can you can set it for thirty days. Uh, so we got thirty days worth of music, and um, luckily Oscar and Jay were able to save some of their music. Um, but yeah, most of the playlists we we reduced to just a couple of. A couple of playlists of in the same songs about 30 or 40 times over. And did, did you say you listen to audiobooks? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, that actually really helped the last, the last part of the row. Um, you would kind of look forward to each individual shift because you'd pick a, a different audiobook for each shift, you know. So um, Mitch and I were listening to Lord of the Rings um, during the later part of the evening and uh, with different adventure books, you know, with, uh, with Aldo Kane and Louis Rudd and we found it really helpful just getting into their adventures uh, as well as ours. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And um, of course, the thing everyone's dying to know what what's it like when you sight land? It was um, it was unusual, really. It was um, we agreed that the first person to spot land would get a, a tot of rum. That was Oscar's um, Oscar's call was um, in old uh, naval tradition. Uh, get a tot of rum. Um, but it, it was it was bizarre. It really um, I don't really have any words for it. I don't know whether any of the team members have any words for it, but um, it was obviously fantastic. Um, but it really you know sent it home that the, the journey was almost over. And it was a, I guess it was quite sad actually in a way. Um, yeah, I'm sure you'll experience it when you crack yours. Yes, yes, I'm looking forward. Well, gentlemen, is there anybody you'd like to thank before we? Um, before we cast anchor or whatever nautical term we're supposed to say, drop anchor. Start with, uh, uh, we'll stick with Connor. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to, uh, if, if I can hand that back over to, um, to Jay and Oscar or either the two, um, cause they've, they've had this from the very beginning. So they've got a lot of people to thank. I think, um, who would, who would uh, say it better than I would, if that's okay with you. Yeah, okay. Oscar, you, you go for it then. Okay, yeah. So for us, I, I think the big ones, the, the main names that we'd like to thank is uh, uh, obviously Jack, who I've mentioned earlier, Jack Broughton. He's, uh, he's our, our sort of main guy back here in the UK, uh, key critical man in the team. Um, you know, he couldn't be on the water, unfortunately, with us, but he, he, was, he was just, just, as, just as involved in the team as, as, as the rest of us uh, and a key member of it. Um, so thanks to him. Thanks for everything he's done. He's been a, a key member of the, the team for that for those reasons. Uh, we'd also like to thank Chris Martin for for helping out and, and digging out and getting everything sorted, getting us on the water. Uh, Nick as well, who's 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 been our sort of mentor. Uh, he's a help of one of Chris Martin's Chris Martin's friend who came out and helped us. He, he was sort of mentoring us in Gran Canaria. And he's met us here in Barbados and he's he's sort of sorted everything out for us here in Barbados as well. Um, and and all everyone who's supported us, who's donated or just followed our progress, uh, and and sent lo- you know we were getting loads and loads of messages from people whilst sent through Jack or sent to us individually uh, whilst we were on the water, and that that was huge motivation for us to to, to get through and, and push through the tough days and everything. Um, so so and and it was a real lifesaver. 
Uh, also, um, Harry Twells was a key member of, of helping organise um, our side of the team, Jason I's side, the, the Atlantic Dagger side. He, unfortunately, he, he got pulled off at the last minute, as I said. But he was a real driving force behind the fundraising and, and behind behind our team um, before he got pulled off. And and since then, he's been he's been still pretty heavily involved with the team and a critical uh, planning member of the team. So, yeah, thanks, thanks to all of those guys and, and everyone else. And Mitch, have you got any anything to 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 add, mate? Uh, no, just echoing what, what echo, what, um, echo, echo, echoing what um, Oscar said there. Uh, big thanks to Chris and Nick and Harry and for giving us the opportunity and everyone, friends and family at home, um, everyone that made it possible. Really, just just the little messages which came through, and obviously everyone had their own like um, companies and sponsorships, like my own company, Black Onyx. They helped a lot, and loads of other companies that made it possible. Um, and yeah, so basically, just what, what, what um, Oscar and the lads were saying. Um, yeah. Uh, He's pretty much, I think he's thanked everyone for us, but the friends and family and support really, which got you through the hard times. That was one of the biggest ones Who, um, for us. Which which companies were generous then with their sponsorship? We should give them a mention. Probably had that back to Oscar. Um, in a, yeah, uh, for, for the main ones, because I say we weren't involved at the beginning. Um, uh, I'll hand that back to him. Hmm. Okay, Oscar. Yeah, so so we had quite a few uh, quite a few people help donate us. We had we had uh, we had companies such as as uh, Jace's Jace uh, made a very very generous donation from his 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 own company Blur Tattoo. He's a tattoo artist. Uh, we had we had companies. Um, we had even personal donations from from the uh, scout troops up in Chester. Um, we had um, quite a few people. Uh, if I can give you a list, Chris, we'll put them in the in the description, maybe as as thanks. If that works. Yes, why not? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, cool. All right, gentlemen. That just, thanks to all those. Yeah, yeah. That just remains for me to thank you all very much again. Um, just really, uh, you've done yourselves proud. You've done the nautical community proud, and 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 the and the Marines and the Merchant Navy. And uh, you've done the podcast proud, guys, by coming on and, and sharing your story. Um, to anybody, our friends at home. Thanks, Chris. And thanks for having us as well. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Absolutely. Um, we'll put a link for the um, GoFundMe page as well under the video. So friends at home, if you can reach in your pocket and maybe pull out a fiver, for what these guys have done and you'll be helping to support struggling rural Marines. Um, that would be much appreciated. So just stay on the line guys, but um, yes, massive. Thank you again.